Well, so far we've been in the church and we've been in the home and you see where your children, we look from when they were very young uh, into their middle school, high school years. And today we're gonna make a transition into those days after high school and talk about when your faith becomes their faith. I'm very blessed to have multiple degrees beyond high school. I wanna tell you about one of those. My granddad went to my college graduation and my granddad was a country boy. There's nothing wrong with that. He was awesome. But you can imagine us going to the graduation. It's a couple of hours from my hometown where we grew up. And when I was graduating, you've been there. They're acknowledging the honor graduates. For example, if somebody has a high uh, academic standing, they're cum laude or summa cum laude, magna cum laude, all these different words they use. And so people would come by and they'd say, you know, Jim Smith, magna cum laude, or Cindy Wilkins, summa cum laude. And after a while, they were calling these names out. And by the way, when I came by, they said Steve Farr, oh, laude. It didn't work well. I didn't, didn't excel that much when I was at that point. But what was interesting was my granddad turned to my aunt. This is a true story. and said, there sure is a lot of them from that laude family graduating, ain't they? That was hilarious. And I appreciated the fact that he was there. And it meant a lot to my family. It meant a lot to me. And I, I'm happy to say that in my college journey, if anything, it solidified my faith. And one of the interesting things about our study that we found was how important those years are. And we're going to begin to talk about that as we talk about making your faith uh, become their faith, which is, I think, the goal for everybody. You know, the task of raising a child and the task of discipling a child if they're in the church is not complete when your child graduates from high school. But I'm finding sometimes, uh, really oftentimes, in parenting and in church life, we're treating it as if the job is done. The research revealed that the experience of your child between the ages of 18 and 22 is critical. Now, I want to be honest with you. I did college ministry for three years of my life, and I've always loved college-age young adults and college-age ministry. And my girls have grown up, and all three, two have graduated in college, one's in college now. I'll be honest with you, though. I did not see how huge this issue is of what happens in your child's life between the ages of 18 and 22. As a matter of fact, it may be in some ways the most critical part of their faith journey. And as we look at this session today, I hope it becomes on, you know, important to you and it, it makes it on your radar. It's critical to their faith development. So what I want to ask is how can you guide them, your children, the children in your church from adolescents, into adulthood and joyfully experience your faith becoming their faith. I think that's the reason that you're a part of this Bible study. That's what you desire for your children. I know that is my desire for my girls. Now, these next two sessions today and the following session that you'll be a part of, it's kind of like an A and a B, a part one and a part two. So let's go to that part one today and let's start with the Word of God as we try to do every week. And we'll be today in First Peter. Matter of fact, you can look at one verse, and I love preaching and teaching from this text, but let's just look in this introductory comment that Peter makes as he's writing this letter to these churches in verse 13. Let's read it together. It says, Therefore, with your minds ready for action, be serious and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of times you look at a text and like, okay, now what? Or so what? Well, let's talk about why that's important. Let's think about, first of all, who wrote it. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it was Simon Peter. Well, who was that? Of course, Simon Peter was one of the 12 apostles. That means that he literally walked with Jesus for three plus years. I mean, side by side. It's important that you understand that about him. And as he walked with Jesus... I would just tell you, if, if you've had ups and downs in your faith journey, well, Simon Peter walked with Jesus. He had his ups and downs also. I mean, you can relate to him and he can relate to you. So when he writes, it should certainly get our attention. But what we need to hear here is he struggled in his faith, just like you and I do sometimes. But when it's said and done, he remained committed and ultimately gave his life for his faith. He was literally crucified. And history tells us that he was so passionate in his faith, so humble in his faith at the end that he felt unworthy to be crucified in the manner of Jesus. And history tells us he was crucified upside down at his choosing, not feeling worthy to be crucified like his Lord. 
Now, why was he willing to do that? It wasn't just the impact Jesus had on him day in and day out. It was that he saw Jesus crucified and saw Jesus resurrected. It was life-changing. So when we have a letter from somebody like that that's been preserved, it merits our attention. That's what 1 Peter is. It's one of two letters we have in the New Testament that Peter wrote to the churches. And it's as relevant today as when he wrote it to those churches. That's why it has been preserved in the Scripture. So as we consider this verse, notice, therefore, with your minds ready for action, be serious. That's his point. That's how he starts. Take your faith seriously. Because if you're not taking your faith seriously, it's very unlikely that your children will take their faith seriously. And you'll begin to see that as they get into their older adolescence, as they begin to, begin to get into their younger adult life. Now, what, what does this mean, take your faith seriously? I think sometimes it's important to talk about why something doesn't mean. It does not mean that you can't have fun. So I want to encourage you right there. It doesn't mean you go around with a serious, pious look on your face all the time that you can never smile. That's not what mean, uh, taking your face seriously means. And, and likewise, it doesn't mean that you can't enjoy life and that you can't do things that, that bring joy and pleasure. That's not what this is about. As a matter of fact, let me give you an example. Okay? If someone takes their family seriously, that doesn't mean they don't enjoy it. Quite the opposite. Someone who takes their faith seriously does enjoy their family. Likewise with your faith, someone who takes their faith seriously does enjoy their faith. They do enjoy the journey. They do have fun, but they also have a good balance there. They know when to be serious, when to be somber, when to be sober, and when to be enthusiastic, and when to be passionate. And so when Simon Peter says, I've learned, and you need to learn as a church and as an individual to take your faith seriously, uh, it means that you can take joy in it. Uh, what it means is this. It means that your faith takes its proper place in your life. And there's a question. As a parent, as a church leader, does your faith have its proper place? Well, let's just ask the question. Let's get personal here. How about, how about your faith in Jesus? Does it take its proper place in your life? Is your life centered on your relationship with Jesus. Some, sometimes I hear people say, you know, that Jesus needs to be the first thing in your life. He needs to be your priority. And I understand that, and I appreciate the sentiment behind it. But it's not a matter of Jesus being first in your life. It's a matter of your life being centered on Him. That means my work, my career is centered on Christ. My family is centered on Christ. My faith, my church is centered on Christ. My recreation is centered on Christ. Whatever I do, it's built on Him. So is your life centered on Christ? And the reason I ask that is this. That tells me whether you're taking your faith seriously or not. For someone whose faith is just a Sunday morning thing, it just has to do with church and Bible study and what happens on Sundays, that means their whole life is not centered on Christ. It means their Sunday is centered on Christ. But it tells me they're not taking their faith seriously. And let me tell you, you can go to church and you can take your children to church, but here's the reality. If they don't see you living it day in and day out, you're undermining the credibility of faith in Jesus. So Simon Peter reminds us, take your faith seriously. I have a good time doing it, but take it seriously. I want to share something with you. I like to tweet, and I hope you'll follow me on Twitter. It's Steve R. Parr. The R is my middle initial, at Steve R. Parr. Here's an example of something I recently tweeted. You must be what you desire your children to become. And that's worth saying again. You must be what you desire your children to become. So if you're 37, what do you want your children to be like when they're 37? If you're 43, what do you want your children to be like when they're 43? You need to be what you want them to be when they're your age or when you're in your life stage. Do you want your children to have a life that's centered on Christ? And certainly it's built in the church, but in the home and day by day, they're living for Him and they're enjoying it because they take it seriously. Well, that begins with you as you model that. And sometimes things are caught, not taught. Yes, you need to teach that, but you need to live it. And they need to see the difference it makes in your life. 
the joy that it brings you, how it affects your decision making, how it affects your marriage, how it affects your leadership, how it affects your parenting. And when you go through difficulties and storms, how you manage those crises in your life because of the Holy Spirit indwelling you because you take your faith seriously. Well, let's talk about what the research revealed, and it's very intriguing. And it has a lot to do at this point about what's happening when they get again to later high school and into those young adult years. We make that transition from adolescence into young adulthood. Well, here's the first thing we discovered in our research again of almost 1,400 young adults who grew up going to church from across North America. Those who stayed in church were 71% more likely to say that they had made a personal commitment to grow in their faith. Now, you say, Steve, what, what are you talking about, personal commitment? Well, we talked some weeks ago about your child's salvation experience. You might recall we talked about how most who grew up in church and are still there came to know Christ when they were young, but not too young, not when they were two and three and four, but usually between the ages of 5 and 12 or 13, right in there, that was the more common place. And we saw that the older a child gets beyond that, the less likely they are to come to faith, especially when they get beyond the high school years. But we, we saw something different in our research and in our discussions with these young adults. Not only did they have this salvation experience, but there was something that happened beyond that as they began to grow where they had made a definitive personal commitment to grow in their faith. It was a commitment their mom made for them or their dad made for them or their pastor made for them or their youth pastor made for them. It was a commitment that they made as they were, again, taking their faith journey. Now, certainly it was initiated by their salvation as they placed their faith in Jesus. But it seems like those who are still in church, their faith journey and their commitment was solidified by a personal commitment, and here's the key, that came later in the journey. And not to get too deep into soteriology, which is a study of salvation, and to acknowledge that you know God saves and, and it's by God's grace. But once we come to Christ and we begin to grow in our faith, there seems to be a, a benchmark or a milestone or something that happens in a growth of a young adult, and it happened in my life. I came to know Christ uh, when I was 13 years of age, but it was at 17 years of age that I had a moment like this. Now, I mean a moment that was just very personal when I was all alone in my room, and I, I really don't want to get into all the details, but it was some family issues that we were having, and I don't want to reflect negatively on those who were a part of that, but really it just brought me to my knees. It, it made me desperate, and I was in a place where I was in my room as a I don't remember if I was 17 or 18, but it was my freshman year of college. Let me tell you, I was literally on my face. I'm not, I didn't say I was kneeling down. I didn't say I had my head bowed. I was on my face before God. And the whole resolution of that was to say to God, God, whatever you want to do with my life, you do it. Now, just so you know, I'm a, a minister, but I wasn't called into the ministry until five or six years later. And you need to hear that. My call to ministry came later. This was a piece of that. But this was just as a young man where my parents' faith now became my faith. And how, how, how can we make that happen? How can we provide that environment? What we've been learning already, you know, answers that. But I want to take it another step. Here's something you need to hear. And this is not from our research, but I, I looked this up. It's estimated that 1.2 billion people in the world who say they're Christians are actually what we would call nominal Christians. Now, what does that mean? It means if you were to ask them their religious affiliation, they would tell you that they're a Christian, but that's the extent of it. They're not engaged in church. They do not read the Word of God. It's Christian in name only. It's like being born into the family. There's some people who live in our country who think they're a Christian because they live in America. Well, there's some people who think they're a Christian because their grandparents were Christian or their forefathers were Christians. And... You and I know that it's not where you're born. It's not who your parents were. It's not the church that you affiliate with that makes you a believer, but it's personal faith in Jesus. 1.2 billion are nominal Christians. How is it that we raise our children so they don't become nominal Christians, just Christian in name only? A third thing here, 70% of high school grads will go to college. 
you say, well, so what? Well, it, there, there's something important we found, and it, it surprised us, quite frankly. And I think it's really North American cultural. I, I think if you went to China or Indonesia or Latin America someplace, you would not find this to be true necessarily. I think it has to do with our culture. But, but to set this up, hear this. 70% of high school grads go to college. Now, of, of, when you look at it b- more broadly, 42% of high school grads will eventually, within six years, get a degree from college. And that's going to become important as we did our study, uh, as we learned about what keeps children connected to church into their adult lives. We talked about the importance of apologetics. We talked about the importance uh, some weeks ago of uh, your child's view of the Word of God. We know when children go to college that they're intellectually challenged, but we found something very intriguing about going to college and how actually attending, ultimately for those who grew up in church, it seems to enhance or help them in their faith. So let's dig into that. Well, those who did not attend college in our survey or those who attended and never graduated, now again, this is in North America, and listen to this, this was a surprise, they were twice as likely to have strayed from church. Did you hear that? In North America, a child who does not go to college or goes and does not complete their degree are twice as likely to be out of church when they're 35 years of age. What? Where does that come from? There's nothing in the Bible about that, so this was very intriguing. It's going to go back to our text, though, about taking your faith seriously, so we're connecting some dots here. But you need to hear this, and the younger your child is in some ways, the more important it is that you hear it and the way that you're guiding them and the way that you're directing them as they move in their faith journey. So I'll I'll admit this was a big surprise, and I want to just make this clear. It's not to suggest that college is required for your child to be a success, for your child to be a believer, for your child to grow in their faith. That is certainly not true. I, I know a lot of people who never went to college, they're very gifted They've got great passions. They started businesses or uh, they went to work at some uh, factory or something or they, they went to, into management of some area or, or just labor. And they're doing great and have great salaries. But again, hang on a second. We, we've got to see something's going on here about the college experience and the likelihood that your child will be in church. And it was a, a big issue, not a small issue, twice as likely. Well, let's think about it. Well, one thing I want to share with you is that when we ask those who stayed in church, why are you still there? Uh, When you read the book, and I hope you will read why they stay, but you'll notice in that chapter, and it's towards the end, when people ask to describe why you're still in church, it was interesting the top five self-described reasons. Here they were. Family upbringing was number one. Number two was obligation to serve. Hear that. Number three was the grace of God. Number four was love for Jesus Christ. And number five was it is a priority and I'm personally committed. And and there's the key there. But we see roots of that in love for Christ and uh, obligation to serve uh, in my family upbringing. And then add this fourth one of it's a priority for me and I am personally committed. Now, we're going to give some application, but let me give you one more thing from the research before we do that. Where your child goes to college also may make some difference. Our research suggests that. We found that those who attended a Christian college were 90% more likely to have stayed in church than all others who did not go to a Christian college. Let me say it another way. If your child attends a Christian college, our research showed they are twice as likely to be in church as a young adult as those who do not. It makes a huge difference. Now, Do they go to a Christian college because they're strong in their faith? Or did they go to a Christian college which made them strong in their faith? What's the chicken and the egg? Which comes first? I don't know. But we do see that attending a Christian college makes a huge difference. Now, it goes back to my premise that this window of age 18 to 22 is critical in the faith journey of your child. And what happens is when you get them to a Christian college at this point where they're making their own decisions and they're They tend to go in one direction or the other. You know what I'm talking about? But imagine this. You send them away, but as you send them away, you're surrounding them with professors and peers who are genuine and committed in their faith. Well, it begins to add up. They're more likely to continue to be committed in theirs. So Christian college is important. Well, what does this mean for parents? We have several things we need to look at here and consider 
in terms of making your faith become their faith. Here's the first thing. The goal, I think we'd all agree, is for your child to grow up committed. Uh, not just to be Christian in name only. So let's talk about that word nominal Christian I used a while ago. Nominal Christians affiliate verbally, but not actively. Again, they're Christians in name only. And sadly, there are too many out there. If your child is a nominal Christian, not going to be in church when they're an adult. They'll be part of the 1.2 billion in this world who it's by name only. And I'll just, I'll just tell you straight up, it is not by saying I'm a Christian that makes me a Christian. It's not by saying I'm a Christian that makes me right with God. It's not by saying I'm a Christian that ensures that I'll spend eternity in heaven. It's not by saying that I'm a Christian that brings the forgiveness of my sins. It's when I genuinely repent of my sins and place my faith in Jesus, not because mama did or daddy did or grandmama did, not because my preacher told me so, but because God did something in my heart and in my life. And he did that for me. And he did it when I was, again, just about 13 years of age. And it was personal. It became more personal as I grew. And it was evidenced by my commitment. But not only do we have a lot of nominal Christians, we have a lot of others who aren't in church regularly. And I'll call those cultural Christians. Cultural Christians generally are the children of those who do attend church. Uh, it, might, it might be yours. Now, again, there's no guarantees. I want to emphasize to get this point. You can do everything right as a parent, and your child can stray. Uh, I've used the illustration before. I mean, God's the perfect father. Adam and Eve strayed. We all have. We're talking about that environment we can develop and create, which more likely ensures they'll not only come to faith, but be in church into their adult lives. Well, a cultural Christian has the vocabulary because they've grown up around it. Uh, they participate in the sacraments. They enjoy that. They'll, they'll go back for Christmas and Easter, for communion, for the Lord's Supper, for baptisms. They are, are still connected to some of the traditions of the church, which is, uh, again, can be healthy. Again, but our faith should not be built on the traditions. The traditions should just anchor us to our faith. And, and sometimes in their attendance, they're, they're committed and they'll attend church, if not sporadically, maybe somewhat regularly. But here's where you begin to draw the line. They don't serve in the church. They, they're loosely affiliated, in other words, but they don't serve. They don't invest. They don't likely give. They don't tithe. Uh, they're, they're, they're not, again, all in in their commitment. They don't share the gospel. They're not witnesses for Christ. And here's the sad thing. They don't impact anybody for the gospel at work, at school, in the community. Between me and you, some people don't even know they're Christians. They may know they're moral, but they're not really that committed. So how is it we get our children from a faith journey where they genuinely know Christ, where your faith has become their faith, not because it's yours, but it's because of what Christ has done for them? Well, a, a, another application is to remember this. College will not and does not make your child a believer. Uh, I want to be clear about that when we talk about these issues this week and next week. Nor does college cause your child to grow spiritually. But here's what you need to hear. It may reflect on what they've learned about commitment. Now let's talk about that for a second. I've got two daughters who are college graduates and one who's going to be graduating within the next six months. And I, I'm really excited about that. I was one of the first ones in my whole extended family to go to college. Uh, some others, by the way, have graduated. I don't want to suggest they have it, but I was one of the first, and it was an exciting time for my family. And I, I didn't do that well academically growing up. I've really excelled and improved in that as God has worked in my life, honestly, moving through my faith journey. My oldest daughter, who was my strong-willed child, who was a real challenge to us and, uh, quite frankly, difficult to parent many times, and who has begun to rebound in her faith journey as an adult, although she had disconnected for quite a few years. She told me after her college graduation, and this kind of intrigued me, and also it kind of uh, inspired me a little bit. She said, Daddy, I, I didn't know I had a choice. She graduated from college. She went and graduated. She didn't know she had a choice about whether to go to college or not. She didn't know she had a choice about whether to graduate or not. And by the way, it served her very well, as a matter of fact, I will tell you. 
Uh, I recently uh, was blessed that she gave birth to my first grandchild. She's out on a 12-week leave. Let me tell you, she's so committed and diligent in her work and so appreciated. Before she left for her leave, they offered her a, a, a raise, uh, a merit raise, to make sure she comes back after the 12 weeks. That's the kind of young lady she is. That's the kind of work ethic she has. That's the kind of commitment that she has. And so it's my place as a parent to try to, you know, pour that into her when she's growing up. She didn't know she had a choice. You know, I'll give you a story about one of my other daughters when she was younger. She was playing basketball. She was like 10 years of age. And she came to me and said, Daddy, I'm not going to play basketball anymore. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, I'm going to quit. Now, we're in the middle of the season, bear in mind. I said, no, you're not. She said, why not? I said, well, we're in the middle of the season. She said, but I don't like it. I said, don't matter. She said, but I want to quit. I said, no, you're not going to quit. Again, she said, why not? I said, well, let me ask you, what is your name? And she told me her name. I said, what's your last name? She said, Par. I said, well, here's why you can't quit. I said, Pars don't quit. Now, parents, listen, th that was important part of her faith journey. For me as her dad to look in her eyes and say, hey, you, you don't quit. Pars don't quit. And I said, you don't have to play next year if you don't want to. You don't have to play in high school because she was young. I said, but... You've made a commitment. So she cried. She went to mama, you know, and, and boo-hooed and everything. But guess what else happened? She went to every practice. She went to every game. And she fulfilled her commitment. Now, if you know her today, she's a young adult. She's a teacher in a school in another state. And I've seen her go through some things. And this young lady, when she faces an obstacle, she is bulldog determined to do whatever the task is. If you give it to her, do she'll do it. Now, what had happened or what would have happened when she was 10? If I said, I'll oh, quit, don't worry about it. No, in our family, we say, you don't quit. When you put your mind to something, you fulfill it. It's going to affect their marriages. It's going to affect them as parents, that no quit attitude. We don't quit. We say, well, Steve, I thought we were talking about college. Well, well there's a connection here, okay? And, and let's, let's think about that for a second, okay? Going to college is not a requirement, but when you do go, let's think about what happens. Since it's not required, you're not compelled, you do it voluntarily. And not only that, you're, you're investing financial resources. It costs money. If you've gone to scholarship, there's expenses involved. You know how that goes. You've got to have walking around money, so to speak, when you're in college. And so there are those expenses that are involved in that. And not only that, you could be making money. Now you're spending money, and it's going on for four years, so you're losing some, some uh, money-making power, although you and I know over a lifetime a college grad makes uh, – probably twice or more as much as someone who doesn't go, when you add everybody together. Again, there's exceptions to that, I'll acknowledge. But college grads tend to make more, less likely to be unemployed. But here's what you got to hear. Mama's not there to tell you to do your homework. Professor gives you a syllabus, and you got to do it. I remember when I was in college, I had my first biology test, and I made like a 62 on it. I didn't quit. It made me mad. I had this attitude that I'm going to make this work. And man, I just got, again, as my daughter, bulldog determined. And I, you know, buckled down and ultimately got my degree and then went on to get other degrees. And to the point to be Dr. Steve Parr. We've got to teach our children that level of commitment. And I think that is the issue. It's not about college. It's about commitment. It reflects the stick to itness, so to speak, the commitment of your child that they're willing to go and sacrifice and do what it takes to graduate. So I think it's an indicator or it shows something about how committed someone is. Because if they're committed to that, they're more likely to be committed to their family. They're more likely to be committed to their faith. But I think it begins with faith. You're committed. You see it through. I think that's what you'll learn from Simon Peter. I want to share a couple more things as we begin to wrap this up. I think it's important to put Christian colleges on the short list with your child. No, they need not go to a Christian college. And, and, and my daughter in college now is not in a Christian college. She's doing great. But they were on the short list. I think you need to kind of direct them that way if possible. be honest with you, I would have preferred in many ways that she go there. Here's the reason some adults stay. Listen to this. Even when things go wrong at church, it's because they're committed not to people but to God, to Christ, to the body of Christ, the church. And that's what we're trying to get across to our children Committed Christians experience salvation, and if young, here's what you've got to hear, they often experience what I call a taking hold of their faith later on. And it's not because of mom and dad. This happens because of Christ. Passion's the fuel for their personal commitment, and 
personal commitment, that no quit attitude is the indicator. And I think the college experience can be that indicator many times. Now, in closing, you can't do this for your child. You can only pray for them. You provide the environment we've been talking about for this to take place. But it tends to stream out of the environment that you've been learning about in these last several weeks. So how about your commitment to Christ and to the church and to the Word of God and what you're teaching your child about commitment? I want you to take time in your group to discuss this or with your spouse or with another adult that you have confidence in and think about how you can pour this into your child and guide and direct them to having a deep abiding commitment so they will take hold of their faith and that your faith would become their faith.